Today's episode is brought to you by the FAM Certification Program. FAM is the training program you've been waiting for. Designed exclusively for women's health professionals, FAM gives you the tools to not only teach fertility awareness to your clients, but to use the menstrual cycle as a diagnostic tool in your practice. FAM is the only program that will equip you to start teaching your clients within a manageable nine-month time frame. We cut out all of the fluff and focus entirely on the skills you need to master to support your clients. There's no program like it anywhere. We'll be starting in early 2024. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash famlive to join the waiting list and be the first to know when registration opens up again. That's fertilityfriday.com slash F-A-M-M-L-I-V-E. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 495. Today's episode is one that you won't want to miss. In today's episode, I'm sharing my interview with a world-renowned endometriosis surgeon who really gets into a fascinating level of detail on the complexity of the condition itself and really breaks down what I would say are essential practical tips that you need to know if you find yourself in a position where you are thinking about surgery, whether that be for diagnosis or treatment or combination. I found today's episode just the perfect combination of informative and mind blowing. So, you know, buckle up your seatbelts as they say. But before we jump in, let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Dr. Ken Sinervo is the medical director of the Center for Endometriosis Care and an award-winning internationally renowned gynecologic expert specializing in laparoendoscopic excision of endometriosis and advanced minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. A native of Ontario, Dr. Sinervo is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, a member of the Canadian Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and many other professional and medical societies. Dr. Sinervo is frequently sought after for his expert opinion by various biotechnology device and medical institutions as well. A noted author and speaker who lectures globally, he has countless abstracts, publications, and presentations to his credit, and is routinely called upon by the international media for his expertise on endometriosis, various gynae pathologies, and surgical interventions. Dr. Sinervo remains extensively involved in both the patient and professional sectors, contributing his compassionate expertise to countless endeavors to advance endometriosis advocacy, awareness, collaborative care, and disease education. He has been particularly active in striving for reforms in care access and remains a staunch advocate for those with the disease. And though I am reading this from his bio, I feel that you will hear within the interview that Dr. Sinervo is known worldwide, not only as an endometriosis expert and leading surgeon, but more importantly, as a humble, compassionate doctor who truly cares for all of his patients from every walk of life and every corner of the world. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into today's episode. And I'm very excited to be here today with Dr. Ken Sinervo. We were connected by one of our past listeners, actually, Uh, her name is Jenna, and she shared about her experience and difficulties finding a surgeon who was experienced in supporting her with her endometriosis, especially because in her case, her endometriosis was atypical and kind of located in all different areas of her body. Uh, So I'm really thrilled and excited to welcome you to the show. Uh, So welcome to the show, Dr. Sinervo. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, thanks for being here. I'd love to start just by, you know, I I would love to give you an opportunity to share your background, you know, what prompted you to jump into the medical field and then to further specialize into the field of endo. Really, when I was um, in undergraduate school, my friends encouraged me to go into medicine. They thought I had a good disposition and I guess I was kind hearted and um, they felt that I would be a good physician. So I actually ended up changing my specialization in undergrad and going from kind of a more arts background to uh, to medicine. And uh, I did my master's in fetal physiology, and then I did med school in Toronto, and then ended up going to do my residency in Calgary. And then one of the things that I was exposed to very early on in my residency was advanced laparoscopic surgery. Um, I went to a conference with uh, one of the doctors that I was training under. And I saw what was able to be done 
laparoscopically that I hadn't been exposed to during my training. And I think that for probably 90% of our residents, if not more, that's probably still the case. And so it really was a very eye-opening experience for me that, you know, it, it showed me that this was a big niche that was important for patients. And then when I came down to do my fellowship in Atlanta, at the time it was the Endometriosis Care Center, and now it's been changed to the Center for Endometriosis Care. I basically half of the surgeries I did were for endometriosis. And so I really developed a, an interest in it. And I saw the difference in just that one year of training, how patients did after surgery when we excise all the disease that they have, both from a pain perspective and also from a fertility perspective. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting to hear the trajectory and how you kind of ended up specializing in the field. I feel also a good place to start would be share a little bit about endometriosis. Obviously, it's an area that you specialize in now, but I'm really curious about just your, just let us know your kind of overview about the disease and also what you feel about the average kind of GP's knowledge base around endo. Endometriosis is a very common disease affecting about 10% of women. And it can present as early as pre-menarche. So we get some patients who are eight or nine or 10 who actually present with GI symptoms as the first sign that they might have endometriosis. Of course, we don't end up seeing them until they're older, but the youngest patients that I've operated on are about 11 years of age um, because their symptoms are so debilitating all the way up into their 70s because they never had adequate treatment of their disease and they continue to have pain postmenopausally. And we also see that you know patients who have hysterectomies can also still have pain because by definition, endometriosis involves endometrial or tissue that's similar to endometrium growing outside of the uterus, okay? And there are definite biochemical differences and behavioral differences in those tissues. So it's not the same thing as the lining of the uterus growing outside the uterus, okay? And that's a very important distinction to make because that really refutes one of the main theories of endometriosis being retrograde menstruation, okay? So typically most patients present with pelvic pain and or painful periods, but there's more to it than just pelvic pain and, and painful periods. They can have painful intercourse, they can have backache, they can have bladder symptoms, they can have bowel symptoms. And even in Jenna's case, you can have thoracic or chest symptoms, which present as when it first begins as cyclical chest pain or shoulder blade pain. And which evolves into constant chest or shoulder pain in some patients. And so it's, it's very important to understand that it can present in any of these different ways. And you don't have to have like a, a set pattern for it to be endometriosis. It can present in atypical ways as well. And so you just have to be very open-minded when you're you know, seeing your patient for the very first time and listening to their story. One of the biggest problems that we run into is that there's a huge delay in diagnosis from the time patients start having symptoms to the time that they're actually diagnosed with the disease. So typically those patients will, you know, 65% of patients probably present within the first six to 12 months of menarche. Okay. And then, you know, about 20% will present um, over, you know, the next 10 or 20 years. And then, 10 or 15% of patients may have little or no symptoms at all. And they present when they come into the doctor and the doctor feels a mass, and then they end up being diagnosed with an endometrioma or an endometriosis cyst, usually involving their ovaries. So, and that's another reason that sometimes it can be hard to diagnose is because it can really kind of go through a whole spectrum of presentations for, for doctors. Um, and I think one of the problems that we have is that patients often get, you know, if they've got bladder symptoms, they get sent to a urologist. And if they've got bowel symptoms, they get sent to a gastroenterologist. And a significant proportion of those patients get misdiagnosed with 
problems like interstitial cystitis, which is a problem involving their bladder, or they may get misdiagnosed with uh, IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. So what really happens is they're left with those other diagnoses kind of that they're still believing are the main causes of their, of their pain and their problems, when in reality, it's been endometriosis all that time. And one of the biggest problems when that happens is the disease has a chance to progress and it can become more severe in its presentation. So it would, you know, most patients in their teens are probably stage, you know, one or two. But by the time some of those patients get to their late 20s or 30s, they could be stage four. And some of that's pre, you know, predetermined genetically because of the kinds of endometriosis that they have. And it varies by racial background as well, and maybe environmental background or exposures as well. But the sooner you can diagnose someone, the less likely they're going to have long-term problems from their disease. And then really the, the mainstay of treatment is how it's you know treated, okay? Most patients you know that I see have already failed three or four medical treatments. So they've been on birth control or they've been on Depo-Provera injections or they've been on NuvaRing or Trita-Mbrena or even stronger things like Orlissa or Lupron, which kind of puts you into pseudomenopause. And they've usually had three or four surgeries, although about 25% of my patients have never had a surgery at all, okay? And um, so, so I'm a little bit of the exception. They've already kind of been diagnosed a lot of the time, but there really shouldn't be any reason why most patients couldn't be diagnosed within a few years. And if the, if the physicians followed the guidelines and not just try to manage them medically with every possibility before they even consider taking them to surgery, I think we could have a huge impact on the length of time to diagnosis, which is probably one of the biggest things that we have to deal with. There was a study in Europe that showed that, you know, most patients could be diagnosed if you followed the criteria within two years. So why is it that the diagnosis takes anywhere from seven to 12 years, depending on which study you look at? So it tells us that there's a big gap in what our knowledge is and what we actually practice. In terms of what's at the GP level or a pediatrician or um, even at the gynecologic level, you know, most patients, you know, they present their doctors and doctors seem to focus on the other things as opposed to the menstrual things that are really driving everything. And, you know, when endo has a chance to progress, it not only is a cyclical thing that, you know, you have pain with periods or around the time of your period, you now begin having pain throughout the whole month. And then, you may have, you know, other types of symptoms that you didn't have before, like Jenna did with her chest pain or bowel or bladder symptoms that have progressed over time as well. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so much there. I was, I was taking some notes. And so I, I have, I have a lot of kind of follow-up questions. I think potentially the most pertinent for the listener, I mean, it was really interesting to hear you just describe the breadth of this issue, the fact that it could be throughout the body, the fact that it affects women pre menarche obviously throughout their menstrual cycle years, but also post menarche potentially post-hysterectomy. I feel like it's very eye-opening, I'm sure, to many of our listeners to hear that because, of course, many women who've been experiencing endometriosis-related symptoms you know, maybe later in their lives, they get to the point where they say, okay, I'm going to have a hysterectomy. That's going to solve the problem. I'm not going to have this issue anymore. So it is really interesting to hear that that doesn't always solve the whole problem. One of the things that I feel like is really just, I suppose, profound, but not surprising is your kind of critique of the diagnostic issue. And so you're basically saying that if the practitioners followed the diagnostic criteria that more women would be diagnosed within a far shorter period of time. You said something like two years. So what is necessary for diagnosis for any practitioners who are listening? And where where are the gaps? You know, you went to medical school too. So why is this a thing? Yeah, and I, I, I don't understand why there is that big gap there. 
So even if you look at the ACOG guidelines, which are not great, okay, by any means, they encourage a lot of medical treatment, which is basically putting a Band-Aid on it. They, you know, suggest that ablation is an effective treatment and hysterectomy is the definitive treatment. When we know that if patients have a hysterectomy and the ovaries are left behind, 60% of patients will continue to have pain. And even when they have their ovaries uh, removed, 10% of patients will still have pain because the disease itself has not been treated properly, okay? When you ablate the endometriosis, which is what the great majority of doctors do, you're, you're, the disease comes back 40 to 60% of the time, okay? And so when you do a hysterectomy and you either ablate the disease or sometimes don't treat it at all because your thought process is that, oh, the endo is going to dry up and it's going to go away on its own. It doesn't. And especially if there's deeper disease there or there's scarring that's contributing to their pain, those things are still going to be drivers of their pain. And then it can affect other things like their pelvic floor. And then they end up with pelvic floor dysfunction or myofascial disease on top of it. And so really, I think it comes down to the fact that for a lot of gynecologists, they realize that okay, all I can offer them is ablation, okay? And then if that fails, I can only do it so many times before I recommend doing a hysterectomy, okay? So I think from a success perspective, if you know that 40 or 60% of your patients are going to be back knocking on your door for another surgery six or two year, six months or two years from now, it's not a very rewarding experience for them. I think most doctors are highly performing people who expect good results. And if half the time you're, you're failing your patients, I think that lo- that leads to almost like, you know, something in the back of your mind preventing you from wanting to even go down that road. So I think that that's part of it. And um, uh, I, I don't know the other drivers of it, but it's, yeah, it's a very frustrating thing from a patient perspective because so often they end up feeling like they're gaslit and that they aren't getting the treatment that they should be getting, which, you know, if you fail one ablation surgery, I think the next step should be an excisional surgery. And if that means referring them out, I'm hopeful that someday that will be the case. There are centers of excellence or centers of expertise in endometriosis throughout the country. They are there. And there's a lot of other doctors who do excision, but it's a matter of finding those doctors. And ultimately, you know, that what I've seen in my practice is other patients drive new patients to come and seek out doctors who do excision because they've had good results. And even other physicians who you've treated their patients and they've gotten good results, especially for someone like myself who have patients who have very advanced disease or atypical disease, then they know, okay, I've got to send this, this person to that doctor. But it does take some evolution of your mindset, you know, one of the concerns that I think a lot of doctors have is like, well, I'm sending this patient to another doctor and I'm losing a patient. You know, my perspective is I want to like be a co-partner in their, their healthcare. I will look after their pain. I will deal with their endometriosis. And then I want to send them back to their doctor with the understanding that, hey, you know, you you manage their care otherwise. And if there's a problem that you run into that you feel you can't deal with and you feel might be related to their endo or their surgery or whatever, I'll be happy to manage that. But unfortunately, egos are what they are. And sometimes doctors feel like their toes get stepped on when you go see another specialist, especially if you haven't, if the doctor wasn't involved in that decision. So I think that that's another roadblock to some doctors kind of extending that really the the courtesy to their patients to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, and you mentioned ablation versus excision. Could you share with us, go into a little bit more depth of what are the differences between these? You mentioned the excision surgery and the surgical technique. That's the surgical technique. It sounds like that you, you know, use with your patients. Maybe just share with us in a way that we can all understand in our layman's terms, what are the differences in these surgeries? And especially for someone, I'm sure many of the listeners tune in specifically to this episode because endometriosis will be in the title. So, Well, there's, there's kind of like a couple of big differences there. 
Um, so ablation is basically talking about any surgical technique that tries to destroy the endometriosis. So you can use electrical energy, you can use what's called laser vaporization, you can use what's called a harmonic scalpel, which is something like your sonic hair that vibrates at 50,000 cycles per second. So it's really high frequency oscillation that creates energy that destroys the tissue. So there's different modalities that you can try to destroy the tissue. But the bottom line there is that all of them under treat the disease, okay? There was a really good study that looked at patients who had endometriosis and then what they did was they either cauterized it or they vaporized it with the laser. And then what they did was they cut out those areas that they had treated. And they found that 40 to 60% of those lesions that they treated still had disease. And what we do is we make an incision around all those lesions and we cut underneath them so that we're getting the full depth of the disease. So if you could imagine the analogy of someone cutting a tree right at the right at the earth, okay? You basically, that's what you're doing. You may have a little bit of penetration under the soil with that ablation technique, but you're still leaving all the roots of the disease behind. And you know what happens if you leave a little root there, you see, you know, two, two or three years later, you see buds of another tree coming in that spot. Okay. I guess I'm the root grinder. I want to get rid of all those roots that are there associated with the disease. And we can do that effectively. I, I feel 95 to 90 to 95% of the time. So our recurrence rates are five or 10% instead of 60 or 40%. So that's a huge difference in terms of you know, a number of patients that need another surgery or how good the patients are going to feel afterwards. And I even think that some of the techniques that they use for ablation actually can make their pain worse because I have seen patients who felt worse after their ablative surgery. And so I feel that it's very important to realize that. And ultimately, if a patient does come to hysterectomy, that is the main reason I reoperate on patients, not because of their endo, but because they have a uterine source of pain as well. Anywhere from 20 to 40% of women with and without endo, but probably a greater percentage of women with endometriosis also have something called adenomyosis, which is a painful condition in which the lining of the uterus has started growing into the muscle layer of the uterus. And that causes a host of symptoms that are very similar to endometriosis. But when you remove the endo, they're still having pain. Okay, so they'll have painful periods that may be heavy, may be clotty, and may cause backache, and may cause pain with air course that lasts for uh, hours or days afterwards. Sometimes they may have constant kind of just crampy pain all the time. So that's the main reason. We typically will find endometriosis in about five or 10% of all the patients that have been operated on. This kind of, I guess, begets a, a question that some people say, well, if you find it in five or 10% of the patients, um, it may be actually like half the patients that we reoperate on have some endo there. It's usually much less than it was before, but if 85, 80 or 85% of patients don't need another surgery at all, are they cured? We don't like to use the word cure because some doctors feel that you can't cure endometriosis and it's a chronic, potentially a chronic inflammatory condition that is involving other parts of your body as well just because of how the genes may influence the disease. But what I look at is I look at clinical recurrence, okay? So what percentage of patients do I need to reoperate on and find endometriosis? So I still think that it's a very small percentage of patients that end up having endometriosis as a cause of their pain when you excise the disease completely. That is so helpful and very eye-opening. Even just to know about the procedure, it's obviously very different to destroy the tissue, but potentially not remove, right? You, the tree analogy is so good versus actually going for the root. Yeah. One other thing is ablative surgery is practically useless in patients who have more advanced disease. So if you have deeply infiltrated endometriosis, or you have bowel that's stuck to the back of the uterus, or you have endometriomas, and you know a lot of endo on the pelvic sidewalls where those ovaries are stuck to, those things are not going to be helpful at all, okay? Because the only way to treat those that disease is by deep excision, okay? And I think that even people who do ablation 
for the most part, not all of them, but will acknowledge that. Unfortunately, they don't have the skill set to do it. Okay. And that takes extra training and it takes, it takes a lot more time to basically go in and cut out all the disease there than it does to take an instrument and basically rub it over the tissue that can take maybe five or 10 minutes. Whereas an excision of the same person might take an hour and a half. And in severe cases, you know, I've spent as long as eight or 12 hours removing disease, depending on what specialists I've had to bring in along the way. You know, I've, I've had surgeries where I've had four different specialists involved, urologists, colorectal surgeons, thoracic surgeons, hepatobiliary surgeons, which are doctors that work with the liver and the stomach and the pancreas. So you have to have a team of doctors who you work with to be able to do what we call multidisciplinary approach to the treatment of endometriosis so that we have all the subspecialties involved in treating their disease so we can try to do all that's necessary in one surgery and prevent them the additional morbidity of multiple surgeries. Popping into today's episode with a quick question. Do you like paper charting? Today's episode is brought to you by the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook. This is the first beautifully designed, fully customizable paper charting workbook designed with you in mind. With three years worth of charting pages, the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook has you covered. If you've been looking for a solid alternative to charting apps, you'll love this charting workbook. The FAM Charting Workbook is available in both Fahrenheit and Celsius editions and is available in spiral bound paperback and ebook versions. Head over to fertilityfriday.com workbook to order your copy today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash workbook. Now let's go ahead and jump back into today's episode. That is, I feel like that really puts it into context. It made me think of, I, I don't have it in front of me. There was a study that I was reading and it made a, a, a loose comparison to the way that endo kind of sets up shop creates its own blood like its own blood source and all of these things in the body it made a loose comparison to to cancer like benign in the sense that it like uh, so forgive me if i'm saying it incorrectly right but i was reading this paper and it was talking about how these lesions they're like parasitic because they like set up shop and they have their own blood source and they kind of like do like so they're really there like you said with the root like they they kind of like they live there now and so i feel like from what you're saying to have to involve all these specialists, if it's located in this area, you know, you have to excise it, but you also have to kind of protect that tissue and all that. I, I don't know if you want to go into that a little bit more. It's just, it's just so complex when you think about it. Yeah. Getting to the real mechanisms of how endometriosis causes pain or how endometriosis gets started is still, you know, I still think we're in our infancy in that you know, or maybe we're in our puberty level or something like that, but we still have a lot to learn. Okay. When the endometriosis, it can invade into other tissues. Okay. So it can go all the way through the bladder wall and to get rid of that disease, you have to cut out that lesion. Okay. And then you have to repair it. Okay. If it's involving the bowel, the only way to sometimes get rid of that disease is by cutting out that piece of bowel and then reconnecting it. Okay. Okay. The same thing when it's on the diaphragm, we have to go in and we have to cut out that part of the diaphragm that's involved and or remove all the tissue that's lining the lung that's involved with the disease as well. It's really interesting that endometriosis has the ability to turn on genes that release endothelial growth factor, which is what creates blood vessels and other growth factors that create their own nerves. And these are the mechanisms by which endo has the ability to kind of stake claim to a certain area and cause pain or cause other symptoms like pain with intercourse if the deep lesions are behind the cervix or on the ligaments behind the uterus and uh, involve the ovaries and things like that. So yeah, it is very interesting. There's a lot of things there's, you know, if you look at a paper that looks at the mechanism of action of endometriosis, you'll probably run into dozens, if not maybe a hundred different factors that may be part of it. 
And to wrap your head around that takes a, a lot of thought and it's way beyond my level of comprehension. I'm a surgeon. I cut stuff out. I make, I restore the anatomy to normal. I get patients out of pain and I get, hopefully get them pregnant as well when they're, they're able to, I really acknowledge and I appreciate everything that they do, but uh, there's still so much in our knowledge that's lacking there that um, it's going to take a long time before we really get to the bottom of it. And hopefully someday they'll be able to have some other interventions that may be genetically based that may prevent the need for surgery that we do that is is so all-encompassing and potentially complicated just because of the nature of having to do a bowel resection or things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that it's, it's refreshing to hear just you kind of iterate how little we do know about it, how much more there is to learn. I wanted to go back to something that you had mentioned a bit ago. You had mentioned that common theory of retrograde menstruation. So I am an author, so I've written a couple of books and I spend a lot of time reading research, you know, in that endeavor. And so I have read a variety of papers and they always kind of state that because that seems to be kind of like, this is our going theory for why this happens. Could you explain what retrograde menstruation is and kind of just tell us a little bit about why that has been theorized to be the the cause and obviously your take on it? So retrograde menstruation basically talks about the uterus has some uterine activity and tubal activity that allows the tubes to have end- live endometrial cells come out the ends of the fallopian tubes, and then they're deposited in the pelvis. And then what happens is those live cells have the ability to implant into the peritoneum and basically be the beginnings of endometriosis, okay? 80 or 90% of women menstruate out the ends of their tubes. So why do only 10% of women get endometriosis, okay? So there must be some genetic predisposition there if that were the case, or some immunologic problem in those patients that allows the endometrium to get a foothold. But the problem with that is that, okay, so I do a surgery and I excise all the disease on that patient and 90% of the time, they don't get endo again. So why is that? If that's the theory, it should happen all the time in those patients again um, until you do a hysterectomy, but then they still have endo after their hysterectomy. Most of the recurrences that we see are actually not real, like true recurrences. What we see is persistence of disease, okay? So when someone goes in and ablates the endo, and they go back in and blade again. It's almost like you could have taken that first operative report and you just photocopy it. And every time it's the same procedure because they're treating the disease in all the same locations that they treated before. So it's not like it's new disease that got there. It's just they never treated it properly in the first place. Okay. The other thing is, so recurrences don't match up to what the theory suggests. Okay. 10% of stillborn fetuses were found to have endometriosis when they were delivered. Okay. How do you explain that? Okay. Uh, That tells us that the disease was laid down embryologically or the cells that have the ability to become endometriosis were laid down embryologically. And then at some point between the birth and the time they start having periods, the disease gets activated and then it starts causing symptoms. Okay. And that's why, why do patients with bowel disease have you know, symptoms before they even have started having their periods because it was there before they started having retrograde menstruation, okay? As well, endometrium does not have the ability to produce estrogen, but endometriosis does, okay? So it has the enzyme to produce estrogen from the precursor hormones that are floating around in the body. Endometrium does not. It relies on the brain to release the stimulating hormones to create estrogen in the ovaries, to release it into the system through the ovaries. And then that's what stimulates the lining of the uterus. Whereas endometriosis can still produce endo or estrogen in its own microenvironment and enough to stimulate it despite us trying to suppress all the endo that the body's making. And so those are kind of the main reasons that I feel kind of refute the retrograde menstruation theory. 
Yeah, there may be some exceptions to the rule, but I think that they're extremely minor exceptions. I, I, I feel that the disease is probably multiple different presentations, but I feel the great majority of patients, if not close to 98 or 99% are because of, you know, the disease being laid down embryologically or it being converted, you know, the precursor cells being allowed to kind of convert into endometriosis. One of the other things was that uh, I've, I've lost that thought, but there's a lot of reasons why retrograde menstruation just doesn't seem to make sense these days. Mm-hmm. I feel it. Well, I got chills when you said the the stat that 10% of stillborn fetus, fetuses have been found to have endometriosis. And I think when you had first kind of brought up the retrograde menstruation thing, you had also mentioned that women can have endo in all different places. And that kind of seems like, how did, how did the menstrual blood get there kind of thing? And uh, maybe talk a little bit about the endo that's kind of located in all these places that you, I think a lot of people still don't know that it can be anywhere. Yeah. You know, the great majority of endo is within the pelvis. Okay. Where it is located is on the ligaments behind the uterus, underneath the ovaries. Sometimes it can be on the bowel. Sometimes it can be on the bladder and sometimes it involves the ovaries. It can also involve the small bowel, which is kind of sitting in the pelvis a lot of the time. And does the endo, when the bowel is sitting in the pelvis, does it attach to those areas or was it laid down embryologically as well? I don't know. Um, It can involve the cecum, which is the first part of the large bowel and the appendix. So appendix can be involved 10 or 20% of the time, the small bowel about 5% of the time, the cecum about 5% of the time. 90% of the endometriosis involving the bowel is involving either the sigmoid colon, which is the first part of the large bowel as it gets into the pelvis or the rectum, okay? And then we often will see it in other areas. I've I've seen it in the stomach. I see it in the pancreas. I've seen it on the liver. And I'm also, uh, one of the big parts of my practice is I, I deal with a lot of patients who have thoracic endo. Our center has probably treated more patients with diaphragmatic and thoracic endometriosis than any other center in the world. We're close to about a thousand patients for that, which is about a 10th of my practice. And on a yearly basis, it probably makes up about 20% of my practice now. Again, we don't know if it's laid down embryologically. Other doctors that we work with, like Dr. Radwine, he believes it is even if on the diaphragm. Others suggest that in the there's a circulation in the abdomen that kind of goes clockwise, okay? And the idea of this circulation in the abdomen was based on some studies which since then have kind of been refuted as not being very well done or very accurate. So we don't know how valid the idea of this peritoneal circulation is, but that would definitely explain, you know, some of the, why more people have disease on the right side of their diaphragm than on the left, um, about 95% of patients have disease on the right side and 10% on, or but sorry, about 2% on the left and maybe 2 or 3% on both. So that may explain that. And then disease involving the, the diaphragm, typically it'll present atypically. So we can have kind of different ways that it can present. Um, some patients will just have chest pain. They'll either have pain that's close to their rib cage or go to their shoulder because the nerves that innervate the diaphragm also are the same nerves that, that are the nerve roots that innervate your shoulder and your shoulder blade. So it kind of does this thing that we call referred pain. So even though the pain is actually being driven by something on the diaphragm, for the reasons that they share the same wiring, um, it causes pain in the shoulder. And so people don't make the association with, well, if the disease is on my diaphragm, why is it hurt over here? And unfortunately, that's one of the reasons it takes so long for patients to get diagnosed with it is because they'll do everything to try and treat their shoulder. They'll have like shoulder surgery. They'll have all sorts of physical therapy all up there. They'll have injections. They'll have you know massage. They'll have ultrasound. They'll have all of these different modalities of treatment up there when in fact the problem was their diaphragm. And unless you can pick up that association that you know maybe it started out menstrually related to their cycle and then evolved over time to be more constant, then other patients may present with a collapsed lung. And in those patients, instead of seeing deep 
nodular disease, which means basically thicker disease involving the diaphragm, they actually have endo that cause little holes in their diaphragm. And those holes go through a process of repair every month. But if it didn't get repaired enough, it ruptures and allows the lung to leak and, and they get a collapsed lung. They may have endometriosis on the surface of their lung that can cause collapses, or they may have blood in their chest that accumulates every month and they have to get that blood drained. And over time, it causes endometriosis to align the entire chest wall. And so we have to remove the entire chest wall. Sometimes we have to remove the outer layer of the lung itself because it's been so involved and it doesn't want to expand anymore. So we, sometimes we have to do what's called a decortication. So we basically have to recognize that the, the disease has been found in every organ of the body, including the brain, including your nose, including your eye and in joints. It's just a matter of you know, trying to recognize that these could be possible because of endometriosis. You know, things in the brain and the nose and the eye are extremely rare. They're kind of like one in a million. But, you know, sciatic disease is something that we run into as well. So patients will have leg pain that goes along the back of their buttocks, down the back of their leg, all the way down to their foot. Some of those will even have weakening of their calf. And one calf will be smaller than the other because the nerves have are not functioning normally and not able to allow that those muscles to work anymore. In those cases, you have to actually go to a specialist who does neuropelviology that understands the pelvic nerves and can go in there and remove that disease completely off the sciatic nerve. And so it's just a matter of just realizing how breath, how broad the the level of disease can be and just you know asking the right questions of patients too, because if you know, a patient comes in and they've got pelvic endo, but they forget to be asked by the doctor, oh, do you have any chest pain? And the patient will be like, oh, yeah, I do. I didn't know that that could be because of endo. And a lot of doctors won't do that. You know, that's part of our regular questioning. You know, we want to try to make sure we're not missing disease in weird locations and we want to be able to identify it beforehand so that we can have everyone there who needs to be there. Well, that brings me to one of the questions I wanted to ask you. When I reflect back on the interview that I did with Jenna, one of the things that she talked about was that at some point in her journey to you, she was actually, she did undergo lap a laparoscopic procedure. And if I remember correctly, either they didn't diagnose any or they diagnosed some, but not others. And she had said something just about even I so as somebody who does is not an endosurgeon, you know, I would have thought that if somebody finally gets up that courage to get that laparoscopic procedure to see about the diagnosis, so many women are just nervous to even get that procedure done for diagnostic purposes. You kind of think that if there's endo there, it's going to be picked up. So did you want to talk a little bit about that? And from a practical standpoint, from a patient perspective, what do you do to optimize that chance that if there is endo, it's going to be correctly diagnosed? Yeah. Some gynecologists perform a handful of laparoscopies a year, okay? Pelvic pain and you know, going to the gynecologist because of pain makes up about 15% of the consults that a gynecologist sees in their practice, okay? So they may or may not have a lot of experience or a lot of volume to know all the different appearances of endo, Okay. So they may go in there and they may not use all the tools that we use. We use a rectal probe. So we put a like a special probe in the rectum that tells us whether there's scarring there that you just can't see from the surface uh, or an obstruction there that prevents the, the probe from going in the places it needs to be able to go. Or they may not recognize subtle disease. We did a study years ago where we looked at you know areas that we thought for sure were endo and then we looked at areas that, that just didn't look like normal peritoneum or the lining inside the abdomen and pelvis. And so what we did was we removed the areas that we thought were endo and 90% of the time it came back positive for endo, okay? And then we removed the areas that just looked what we call atypical and half of those still came back positive for endo. So I think what happens is, and that makes up a quarter of the yield that we had, okay? So right off the bat, I think a lot of doctors are missing at least 25% of the disease. But in someone like Jenna, who did have significant disease, 
I just can't explain that. Uh, it's really hard to explain that. And diaphragmatic disease is, is commonly missed just because they don't even look up there. Or if they do, they're looking from far away. They don't get their instrument there to push down on the liver, or they don't put an additional port right below the rib cage so they can look with a special scope all the way to the very back of the diaphragm. And, and then if they see it, they don't know what to do with it. Who do I send them to? Do I send them to a thoracic surgeon? Well, they don't operate under the diaphragm. They operate above the diaphragm. So they sometimes don't know how to approach it. So often patients like Jenna are left kind of not knowing where to go. And I personally applaud the patients who do the research. And if they suspect they have endometriosis, that and you always want to trust your doctor. You always want to think that your doctor knows everything and is good at everything. But you can be the jack of all trades, but the master of none, especially when it comes to endometriosis. And one of the things that my my previous partner, who's now retired, who started the center, he said, you don't want to put yourself out as a specialist of everything and to be uh, uh, gynecologic surgically, okay? I don't want to be a pelvic floor surgeon. I don't want to do bladder suspensions and I don't want to do other kinds of things. I just want to be that guy who's known for doing endometriosis. And I think it behooves patients whenever possible to seek out someone who specializes in this and not just an advanced or a minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon, a lot of them have very little exposure to endometriosis or advanced endometriosis. You want to know that this is the only thing they do, okay? If you want to maximize the chances of you getting the best treatment possible. A lot of those minimally invasive gynecologists are going to be able to do it, but some don't, and uh, they or they didn't have advanced training. And that's especially true when they have advanced disease. So disease that's involving the bladder or reimplanting ureters or having to do bowel resections because they often don't have teams that work with them. And so when you, when you're seeking out a doctor, you want to know if you have bowel symptoms, do they do bowel resections? Do they work with a colorectal doctor? Do they have a urologist? If you're worried about your bladder, if you've got a kidney that's blocked, do they have a urologist you work with who can reimplant that ureter? If you've got problems with infertility, how may patients that they see have infertility or endometriosis or endometriomas? Will you be removing an ovary if you see an endometrioma? It's almost never needed at the t when you're trying to be conservative with a patient. Unfortunately, sometimes doctors get in over their heads and they don't know what to do and they end up having to take out an ovary, either because they get into problems with bleeding or they feel the only way for them to remove that cyst is by removing the entire ovary. If they have done endo on the bowel, how many bowel resections have they done? You know, these are important things. You know, I've done about a thousand. So those are the things that you want to know as a, as a patient. We have an article on our website that goes over the questions that you want to ask your doctor if you are trying to find the right doctor for you. And there's a lot of good surgeons out there that are, are very good surgically, but they may not have either the experience or the backup the team that you need to be able to address all the different problems that you may run into with endometriosis. There are very few uber surgeons anymore, okay? 30 years ago, you could get away with being a cowboy and operating and saying, you know, I'll do this, and I'll do that, and I'll do medical legally. I don't think you can do that anymore. So I think you really need to have that team around you. If you find that team and you're happy with your doctor and they make you feel good and reassured, then I think that that's a good fit. And if you have any reservations or concerns, you might have to move on. It's kind of like dating. <laughs> you might not find the right person the first time. You sometimes have to keep interviewing people until you find the right one. Yes. I mean, there's, I feel like this is very just essential information. I have a couple of questions around that. I think one thing, though, I just want to say was, you know, I was thinking about, of questions to ask and I was, you know, thinking, oh, you know, do I ask how many hours in the OR that the doctors had or the number, the percentage of endo cases that they have in their practice. And then you said, it's the only thing they do. And emphasizing that you really want somebody who this is their focus to be able to really help the condition. And that is one of my biggest takeaways from the episode as well, just, you know, from our interview, because when you go into the depth 
in terms of how serious the disease is and all the different areas that it can invade. And then the complexity of the surgical procedure and having to involve these other specialists because it's in the bladder, because it's in the the colon, because it's in the thoracic region. I feel like it really just emphasizes how significant and serious this disease can be and how we really shouldn't be flippant and cavalier. So the one question I had was, does this apply to diagnostics? Because I've heard, you know, a lot of women go into that laparoscopic procedure and the doctor's saying, well, if I see something, I'll just grab it then. (laughs) So does this apply to diagnostics as well? Should you be going straight to that specialized surgeon for a diagnosis in the first place? Well, I think, yes, often, because, you know, if you suspect endometriosis, uh, how many of those patients have gone to their doctor and their doctor's like, no, you don't have endo, you're too young, or you don't have endo, you know, you haven't had babies yet, or whatever reason they they use to kind of dissuade you from having, you know, the surgery. Or if you got bowel disease, oh, well, you're going to wake up with a colostomy, you're going to have a bag the rest of your life. I've done 10,000 surgeries, and I've done, you know, probably around 30, 40,000 hours in the, in the operating room. And I've done a a thousand bowel resections and I have yet to have a patient who's had a permanent colostomy. Have I had a few that have had temporary ones? Yes. That's, that goes with the territory. Whenever you cut a piece of bowel out and you reconnect it, a certain percentage are not going to heal properly. Okay. Even though you do everything technically perfectly. Okay. It's just something, there's a problem with the blood supply there. It doesn't heal perfectly all the way around, whatever. There's a very, very small percentage that have complications because of that. But again, some doctors will try to dissuade you from having a life correcting surgery that gives you your life back because they have no experience in it. And that's how that's they, because they're ignorant on that fact, they might not know how to counsel a patient. Okay. And all too often I see either on Facebook pages where the doctor said this or that, which is not true to dissuade their patients from having the appropriate surgery. And so, yeah, if you're, if you're able to see a specialist, by all means do that, you know, most of my patients, 85% of my patients come from other States or countries. You know, what we do is we have a process where they send in their records and, you know, they fill out online forms and they do a narrative that tells me their story and we look at their operative reports if they've had any or any other investigations that have been done. And then we come up with a plan. And um, if it's someone who I see in the office, I have the, you know, the advantage of examining them. But the exam, most of the time, doesn't make that much of a difference in terms of what our potential plan is. You know, so I, I have a lot of patients who present with a lot of bowel symptoms. And I'll say, okay, well, you might need a bowel resection. Let's do an MRI to see if they see any endo on your bowel. And, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, some of the MRIs aren't read well and they miss disease. We have ways to work around that. We have, you know, the colorectals available if we need them in a pinch. Most of the time we already know beforehand that we'll need them. So we'll be able to do the appropriate surgery. But yeah, I think that when it comes to making that diagnosis, do they even know what to look for on an ultrasound sometimes? Myself and my partner and a lot of the other fellows that I've trained over the years, they know how to do an ultrasound to look for those signs that there could be disease involving the vagina or the rectum or deeper disease involving the ligaments behind the uterus and and or looking for nodules on the bladder. So they've already been trained in how to do that or they know how to read an MRI properly to see if there's disease on that MRI that the radiologist might have missed. Those things might not be something that the average gynecologist has that are important in making that diagnosis. So I think that you're probably going to have an earlier diagnosis and also have somewhat better care, I hope, by seeing someone who just does endometriosis. Mm -hmm. Well, as we start wrapping up today, I would love to invite you to share a little bit more information about your clinic, your practice, for anybody who's either in Atlanta, I think, yes, or obviously around the world. And uh, also I'll connect with you um, once we're finished, because I would love to share that article that you mentioned on the show notes page for the listeners to be able to access the kind of common questions to ask. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you want to learn more, you can either, you know, Google Dr. Ken Sinervo, or you can go to the center for endometriosis care.com or center for endo.com. And that's our primary website. And uh, there's a ton of information there. There's probably three or 400 pages of, of articles about different things related to endo. I think it's probably one of the best informational websites out there. A lot of patients go there with the intent of, you know, finding a specialist, but we just want to educate patients as well so that they go in to meeting a doctor with their eyes wide open and know the appropriate things to, to answer or ask their doctor so that they can get the best person available for them. Yep, uh, centerfriendo.com. And uh, we look forward to helping anyone who's interested. Well, Dr. Sinervo, this conversation has just been very eye-opening and I feel it's going to be a blessing to, I just can't even imagine how many listeners. So I just want to thank you for being here today, of course, for taking the time, but also for the work that you do. I'm sure that you know how important it is. I can't imagine the stories that you've heard in your practice. So I'm sure you already know how needed this work is and just how, how difficult it is for women to find good care. So thank you for that as well. Well, thank you. It's uh, the reward for me is seeing those patients doing better or, or getting pregnant or, or those types of things. And that's what really drives us to keep going. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 495. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode with Dr. Sinervo. I found it to be enlightening, eye-opening, a bit mind-blowing. It was just very interesting to learn from a surgeon's perspective who specializes in endo, just how deep it gets essentially, and the differences between the different types of procedures, and really and truly how important it is to be informed when seeking support for this condition. A few of my takeaways, one is that endometriosis is an extremely serious condition that obviously does not tend to get the attention that it deserves. And especially considering that women with severe period pain tend not to be further looked at or diagnosed. Many doctors are not necessarily familiar with the best practices around this given that the average time it takes for a woman to be diagnosed in North America and the UK ranges from 8 to 12 years. You may have heard that stat before. It comes from a study where they looked at how long it actually took from the onset of symptoms for these women to actually get a diagnosis. And what's interesting is that although it, there, there are you know many different papers, research papers about using potentially an ultrasound, or an MRI to diagnose endometriosis, the gold standard still remains the laparoscopic procedure because there's different ways that certain lesions and scars and different disease tissue can show up in these different types of tests. And ultimately, until someone goes in there, they may not be able to diagnose. And I think one of the key pieces that came out today in my interview with Dr. Sinervo is also that a person who is inexperienced could go in there and look for the, you know, endometriotic lesions. And depending on how they're presenting, what they look like, color, just all the different aspects of, of the diagnosis, they may not be able to diagnose if, if they're not experienced or they may not even look in the correct place. And so false negatives are also possible where you could go to the, go actually get up the nerve to do the procedure, be told that either it's not there or it's not as severe. But if you're dealing with somebody who may not know where to look or what they're looking for, you may not actually get that accurate diagnosis. And that's just something that you wouldn't think. You would think if, if you went to the trouble of, of going through the diagnostics and getting the surgery, you're definitely gonna get answers. And obviously there's cases where that may not happen. Also another takeaway are the different types of the procedure. I feel that Dr. Sinervo's explanation in terms of getting the roots of the disease versus burning off some of the tissue, but having the roots stay in place and how that relates to recurrence rates is huge because I feel the takeaway is that if you are thinking about getting surgery at some point, getting the tissue removed, the endometriotic tissue, then 
it's worthwhile looking for a surgeon who really does specialize in this. And I also found it interesting when Dr. Sinner wrote categorically said, you know, find someone for whom this is all they do. So not even to say they just have a lot of experience with this, but his words were to find someone for whom this is it. This is what they do. This is what they specialize in. And I think from his experience, just from what I gathered from the interview, it's, there's a lot to learn. There's, you could spend your whole career as a surgeon only doing this type of surgery. And think about all the complexity, depending on all the different locations that this disease tissue could present itself in. So certainly something to think about. I mean, there's just so much there. And then also the discrepancy, the, the vast difference between knowledge bases of doctors all across the board. And so the average doctor who does not specialize in endometriosis may not know when to refer, may not be as comfortable or confident in their ability to even know what to look for. And this, unfortunately, is another nod to the importance of you as the woman, as the patient, as the person experiencing the symptoms, educating yourself, the importance of learning what the signs are, what the symptoms are, and really arming yourself with information. I always say that it's not fair. It's not fair that the burden should be on us. I mean, they're the ones that went to med school. You know, they're the ones that paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to learn all this information. They should know it all, right? But they don't. You know, you can't expect your family physician to know everything. And apparently you can't even expect some of the higher level, higher trained medical professionals to know everything either. And so the, it's a combination of doing your due diligence to find a healthcare professional who is specialized in the specific issue that you have or that you're concerned about, making sure that you're not just taking advice from a generalist who may not know the answer, but also taking ownership of it and doing your best to learn as much as you possibly can. I think that those two things le lead to the best possible outcomes. So certainly a lot of takeaways from today's episode. And just, I think, a lot of hope for women who have experienced these issues. And I thought of one other takeaway before I leave as well, is that when I was researching, I've been working on a book project. So you'll be hearing more about that coming up within the next few months. I'm so excited to be able to finally share it with you. But uh, in the research I've been doing for that project, one of the things I came across, and I think I mentioned it a little in today's episode, was that when it comes to unexplained infertility, the standard of care for a lot of women is not necessarily to do further investigation, to, for example, to explore if there could be endometriosis, to try to get rid of that issue so that they could conceive naturally. The tendency tends to be toward going straight to the IVF procedure if the woman is not conceiving. And I think that that is also really interesting because then you could have a situation where you've been doing IVF because that's, they just go straight to that these days. And you potentially could have signs and symptoms of endometriosis, but no one's really looking at that. And, you know, there's different reasons for that. But I think it's important to be aware of that because this approach essentially is looking at those underlying factors, you know, what's going on. And obviously surgery is not the only approach to try to address endometriosis. It's clear that in some cases, this would be the option for women. There's obviously different alternatives and many women do seek to reduce inflammation through natural means and try to improve their symptoms. There's a lot of different ways to approach the condition. But I think that it is really interesting to consider how many women may have this condition, depending on where it is located, have more of a silent type presentation where depending on where it's located and how severe it is and et cetera, they may not be having some of those painful symptoms with their periods or with sex or with other, whether it's bladder issues or bowel issues, et cetera, et cetera. They may have it in a different location or they may just not have it be causing those types of issues. How many women out there potentially have this issue who are also struggling with infertility who are never evaluated? So there's just so many different aspects of it. <laughs> this is a lot longer than I thought it would be. But yeah, just lots of thoughts I wanted to share with you as we wrap up today's episode. So I'm going to end it there. I hope you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as 
as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. And that's a wrap. If you've been loving the podcast, then I know you'll love our Fertility Awareness Mastery Mentorship Program. This is our nine month immersive experience that will completely transform the way that you work with clients, allowing you to not only teach fertility awareness to your clients, but to use the menstrual cycle as a vital sign and diagnostic tool in your women's health practice. We're starting again in early 2024. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam live to join the waiting list and be the first to know when registration opens up again. There is no program like this offered anywhere. Transform your practice in nine months. Join the waiting list over at fertilityfriday.com slash F-A-M-M-L-I-V-E.